Today, I want to start by introducing us to the concept of uh, relative velocity. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, yes, don't always forget. So, what is relative velocity? Okay, now we're going to discuss something about what we call reference frame. Reference frame has a very deep definition, but I'll make it simple for you. It just means like your coordinate system. Like now, my reference frame here is like the floor right now. So, but if I'm moving, I move with my reference frame. So I have left the floor behind. So the floor has its own reference frame. I am moving in a different reference frame. So my velocity with respect to the floor is the velocity with which I'm moving because now the floor is seen to be static. It's, it's at rest and I am the one moving. So if I am standing here or somebody is standing here on the floor, so my velocity is zero because I'm not moving. So my velocity with respect to the floor is known as V person floor. So this is the person, this is the floor. So this is called the relative velocity of person with respect to floor. This is the person and this is the frame of reference you are referring the person to. So if the person is standing, VP floor is zero. The definition is VP floor is V person minus V floor. That's the definition of relative velocity and it's very easy to understand. This means that if I have a particle moving with a velocity of 20 meters per second towards the right and I have another particle moving with a velocity of say 10 meters per second towards the same right. So this is particle A, this is particle B. So what's the, what's the velocity of A relative to B? VAB is VA minus VB. So it will be 20 minus 10, which is 10 meters per second. So, so relative to B, B will be seeing A to move at 10 meters per second. Okay? But what if somebody is by the roadside? Let me call the person R. So what is the velocity of A with respect to R? Is VA minus VR. VA is 20, VR is 0 because it's the roadside is static with respect to this. The person is standing. So that person standing will see A relative to him by the roadside to move with 20 meters per second, which is correct. So if you are standing, somebody moving 20 meters per second, you see the person moving with 20 meters per second. But if somebody is moving with 20 meters per second and you are also moving with 20 meters per second, both of you will think you are together, you are in one place, you think you are standing in one place because you are moving with the same speed. That is why your relative speed will be zero. VA minus VB, VB minus VA will give you zero. So the definition here for relative speed is VAB is VA minus VB. So that is the first definition that we need to understand. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an example here at the end of the class to relate this in a physical phenomenon, to understand what we mean by relative velocity physically, okay? Okay. Now. A man can roll his boat at 10 kilometers per hour, okay, in still water. He wants to get across due north to his house, okay? which is vertically opposite him. Question one. If the water flows due east at three kilometers per hour, in what direction Must he head his boat in order 
to arrive at his house. Question two. This is a practical problem to illustrate relative velocity force. Question two. What is his resultant velocity? Question three. If the water is five kilometer wide, the water is five kilometer wide. How far from his destination will he be displaced if he ignorantly stares northwards? Okay. Now this is the problem. A man can row his boat at 10 kilometers per hour in still water. He wants to get across due to north or due north to his house. So he starts here. His house is here. And his boat is here. He's here, right here. He wants to go. This is five kilometers wide. But this river is flowing, or this water is flowing due east at three kilometers per hour. So he will be very stupid to go straight. Because if he goes straight, the resultant velocity is going, this water will keep displacing him. He's going to end up somewhere here. So he should head somewhere here with his 10 kilometers per hour so that the waves of the water speed will going to drop him in front of his house. So what is that angle he should head? Theta. So simple, this is 3 kilometers per hour. So we say tan theta, or sorry, sine theta is 3 over 10, which is 0 0.3. So theta is the sine inverse of 0 0.3. This gives us theta 17.45 degrees so he must head 17.45 degrees okay 17.45 degrees in a direction that is from the north move towards the west so west of north in order to get to his destination the second question is what is his resultant velocity so his resultant velocity is along this line So VR, that's question two, sequoia is 10 sequoia minus three sequoia, okay? Which is 100 minus nine. So this gives us 91. So the resultant velocity is just the square root of 91, okay? In kilometers per hour. Simple, and the direction is north. Now the question now is, the last question, if he ignorantly goes straight, he thinks, oh, my house is here, so I should go straight. And he ignorantly goes straight, you know the waves of the water will displace him. So the water is 5 kilometers wide, he will be displaced a distance x kilometers. I will draw the same diagram here, and I will use the velocities to represent it. So he's going to move 10 kilometers per hour, and the water is moving 3 kilometers per hour. So I'll use these equal triangles to solve the problem to see how far he will be displaced. If this is theta, this is theta. So tan theta is the same for both, which is x over 5, and that is the same as 3 over 10, comparing these two different triangles for the same problem. So I get it that x is 5 times 3 over 10, which is 1.5 kilometers. He will be displaced very far, 1.5 kilometers from where he's supposed to, he's supposed to get to. Nice! Nice. Now, how does this relate to relative velocity? Yes. How does this relate to relative velocity? I'll draw this bigger. Okay. This is now why we do this in motion in two dimensions. Now, when I have velocity of A relative to B as a value, B relative to C as another example. So I can say, what is the velocity of A relative to C? 
So A relative to C will be V A relative to B plus V B relative to C. This is the first thing you should know. So when I have double relativity, A to C, we start with A and end in C. I'm going to solve that as an example now. That's what is going on here. But before that, let's not forget that V A C is velocity of A minus velocity of C. What if they are moving in? I give an example in the same direction. What if they are in opposite direction? This guy is coming with 2 meters per second and A is coming with 5 meters per second. So, this B already has a minus velocity and A has a positive velocity. So, you have to consider the direction because you are dealing with vectors. So, velocity of A relative to B, VAB, is velocity of A minus velocity of B. But, velocity of B already has a minus sign. It's coming like this. So minus velocity of B will be velocity of B going in this direction. This is minus velocity of B. So it's not going to add. So it's not going to be 5 plus uh, 5 uh, plus 2. 7 meters per second. Okay. Now we understood that example physically. What I want to do now is Remember, VAB is VA minus VB. This is when they are in the same straight line. So if I have velocity of A, 3 meters per second, velocity of B, 5 meters per second, on the same straight line. Is that okay? So A is moving with 3 meters per second, okay? And B is moving with 5 meters per second. So what is velocity of A relative to B? Is 3 minus 5. Minus 2 meters per second. And what is velocity of B relative to A? Is 5 minus 3, which is 2 meters per second. So A will see B moving ahead of him 2 meters per second. B will see A going in the opposite direction with 2 meters per second. So this means that A is moving 2 meters per second slower with respect to B. And B is moving 2 meters per second faster with respect to A. That's what the minus means. What if I give you a vector going like this? So this is vector C, a velocity VC. And this is a velocity VA. Let me call this VB. So I say, what is the VA relative to VB? A particle is going in this direction, another particle is going in this direction. I want to know this relative to that. Now, this is where we put vectors. We have to understand that the VA minus VB means vector subtraction. Okay? So, VA minus VB. So, VAB is VA minus VB. VA will stay the same. Minus VB. VB is going this way. Minus VB will come in this way now. So, it's going to be VA minus VB. So the net, the resultant, this one, okay, is VAB, which is VA minus VB. So you have to calculate this line. So if I know this angle, so this is 3 kilometers per hour, and this is 5 kilometers per hour, I know this 60 degrees, I have to use cosine rule to get VAB squared to be 3 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 3 times 5 cosine 60 degrees. I have to do this subtraction in a vectorial way. Very important. Now, we want to see how we do relative velocities that are in terms of VAB already. That is the example I just gave you. So, we'll see how it happens now. So, I'm going to wipe here to see the same example I gave you. And see what we find. The boat is going up. Velocity of boat with respect to river. Okay? Velocity of river with respect to shore. So I have velocity of boat with respect to river, velocity of river, I want velocity of boat with respect to shore. This will be velocity of boat with respect to river plus velocity of river with respect to shore. So we have boat shore. Okay, we have both shore. So it will be 
Velocity of both this plus this, but it is going to be a vector summation. So it's going to be this line. This is VBS. So I say this square, square root VBR square plus VRS square. Another example is a car coming due east, say at 3 km per hour. Another car coming due north at say 4 km per hour. I say if this is VA and this is VB, okay? Okay, so I say, or oh, this is VA with respect to the ground, VB with respect to the ground. So I say, what is VA with respect to B, VAB? So, okay, now, VAB is what I want. But I know VA ground, and I know VB ground. If I sum this up, I will get A ground. That's not what I want. I want AB. So how do I make this V ground B so that it will be VA ground plus V ground B to give me VAB, which is what I want. So it's going to be this is plus this. Okay, VA ground is this. But VAB to get VGB is minus VGB, that is VB ground. You see that now? So it becomes... VAB equals VAG. I don't have VGB, but I have VB ground. So I put a minus V ground B. So this will give me VAB. So A is coming this way, A ground. Ground B is going that way. Minus ground B will be going downwards now. So this net force is VAB. So it is VA ground minus V ground B. Do you want to go in here? So if I know this to be 3 and this to be 4, it's just the square root of 3 square plus 4 square. That will give me 5 kilometers per hour as VAB. And I can get the direction as I want. So the same thing. So you have to put the direction into consideration because these are velocities. These are all velocities. So that's how we deal with relative velocities. So the summary is, if it's a single VAB, is VA minus VB vectorially. And if it is VAC, it is VAB plus VBC, vectorally. Relative velocity. In physics, everything is relative. Relative. The air is spinning at an angle of, or at a speed of 30 kilometers per second. But relative to me, because I'm spinning with it, I think it's at rest. <laughs> so everything is at rest to me because I don't understand what's going on out there, okay? So everything's going, if you take away relative to the Earth, everything's going, you know, 60 miles an hour plus. Whatever. Minus the, yes. the exactly. rotation of the Earth. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly. what it's at. But we just treat that speed that we're going as zero. No. We don't treat it as zero. The thing is, when you move, that's how you understand relative velocity. If I'm in a car, oh okay, you get it. Okay. Moving at twenty miles per hour, and there's another car here. So relative to the Earth. Exactly. Yeah, but relative, relative to, to other things, things there. Oh, okay. <laughs> so now that's why everything is relative. So this guy is also moving at twenty meters per second. We we'll look at each other as if we're in one place. Because, we're, hey, what's up? We'll talk to each other. Hi, good to see you. Because we'll think we are standing in one place. <laughs> so, relative to each other, we are starting. But relative to this guy here, he said, what are these crazy guys doing? They are talking and they are driving. <laughs> you see? So, this guy here, we see you guys moving at 20 seconds. Because he is standing. But if this guy was moving at 25 meters per second, Relative to this guy, you will see yourself slowing down at 5 times a second. And this guy will see himself moving ahead of you at 5 times Like, that is what relative velocity is. Okay? But it gets complicated. Okay? It gets complicated. Okay? If I'm in a car moving at 20 meters per second, I move 2 meters per second inside the car. Now, my speed relative to the car, okay, is 2 meters per second. But my speed relative to somebody standing outside is 2 meters per second plus the speed the car is moving. <laughs> if I move against the direction of the car, inside the car, 2 meters per second in the opposite direction, okay, my speed relative to the car, okay, will be minus 2 meters per second, this way. Is that okay? Is that okay? So it's going to be whatever the car was moving minus my speed. 
But that guy will see me as that minus my speed going in this direction. So it'll be say 20 minus 2. So that guy will see me moving in this direction or moving uh, in the direction of the car with 2, two meters per second less than the speed of the car. Because I'm reducing my total speed by coming in the opposite direction of the car. Okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's okay. We can always call this part up. <laughs> okay. Motion in two dimensions. Motion in two dimensions. And particularly, there are lots of motions in two dimensions, but the one we're interested in is the projectile motion. Projectile motion. So what is a projectile motion? Okay? So we say projectile motion is the motion of an object in a vertical plane. I will explain some of this, okay? Such that once thrown, or you say projected, once projected or thrown, or dropped, okay? It continues only with its own inertia. Explain some of this basically. It continues only with its own inertia under the influence of the gravitational pull of the Earth and in the absence of air resistance. This is very important, we ignore air resistance, okay? In the absence of air resistance. So some people will tell you it is the motion of a particle or a body in a parabolic path. A parabolic path is, is just one example of projectile, okay? It doesn't have to be. When you throw something vertically upwards, the trajectory is not parabola. The trajectory is just a straight line, okay? It is also a projectile. And we're going to look at all the cases of projectile. Is that okay? All the cases. I split them into four. So we're going to look at all four cases of projectiles today, okay? And um, so what do I mean by the motion of, a, of, of an object in a vertical plane? Yes, vertical plane. A plane is two-dimensional. This is a straight line. This is a plane. That is why we're discussing two-dimensional motion. So you have XY plane, okay? We call it XY plane. You can't call a straight line plane. Is that okay? So a plane is two-dimensional has X and Y. Okay, let's use the parabola you know. When you throw an object in the parabola, it goes like this. When you look at the, you follow the particle where it goes, it's cutting through X and Y at the same time. So it's going in a plane. If you just cut that trajectory alone, okay, it's going in a plane. So the particle goes like this, I can represent it on that plane. Okay, even if the particle comes like that, I have another plane. I have a plane like this, I have a plane like that. I can take one plane for each projectile motion. So it is the motion in a plane. That is the first thing. A vertical plane such that once it is thrown or dropped or once that particle is moving, the only thing that keeps it in motion is its inertia. So inertia means your tendency to remain at rest or to move. We're going to explain this more when we look at Newton's laws, probably from next week, okay? This, this, bag, this bag on the table has lesser inertia than the table itself because it's easier to push the bag than to push the table. So the table has more inertia to remain at rest. Okay, when you start pushing something, it's moving. How easy can you stop it? Also depends on the inertia. Something with more inertia is less, is, is more difficult to stop. Something with less inertia is more easy to stop. Is that okay? So it has to do with stability and motion in one place or moving. So when you propel this object, the only two things that make it move is the influence of gravity on it and the inertia with which it was moving before. So we see how gravity will influence that inertia, okay? And then we say in the absence of air resistance, because air resistance always slows particle down. Sometimes we compare. If there was air resistance, somebody jumped, we saw the height it jumped. Now calculate, you see, your calculation will be a little more than the height it jumped. Because 
when he jumped, there was air resistance that your calculation does not take into consideration. Is that okay? And then there's some advanced projectile motion when you go to the intermediate physics that gives you an equation for air resistance that you can put in these equations to see the effect of this air resistance. But we will not do that for this, uh, for this level. Is that okay? Okay, now, the, the projectile motion is different from projectile. There is a difference between projectile motion and projectile. Projectile is the object that is undergoing a projectile motion. So when I throw this marker in a parabolic path, okay, this marker becomes a projectile. And the motion of the marker is what we call projectile motion. Is that okay? Is that okay? So that is one thing you should know, the difference between projectile motion and a projectile. So if I jump in a parabolic path, I am now a projectile. Is that okay? Is that okay? So anything can be a projectile. So that object that goes through the definition of the motion of a projectile, that object is what we call the projectile. Is that okay? It's called the projectile. Now, I'm going to start to explain to you by giving some examples. Can you tell me some things you think are moving in a projectile? What do you think? Can you give me some examples of what you think moves in a projectile? A baseball. A baseball when thrown, right? Or kicked, right? Soccer ball when kicked, right? Do you have any other ideas of something you think moves in a parabola or in a projectile? Just any of the sports balls, I mean football. Exactly. Balls. Any of the sports balls, okay? On that goes That's a very good example, okay? We have those balls. We have, um, like, when you project, uh, when you shoot a gun, okay? You shoot the bullet from the gun, okay? You see, the bullet moves in a projector. Is that okay? Or when um, 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 anything you throw, when you throw something, okay? Vertically upwards or you throw it at some horizontal, uh, along the horizontal, we're going to look at different cases. Or something just dropped from a tree, a fruit just dropped, okay? It's a projectile motion, okay? It's just one that, that path is just a straight path. So the object that undergoes the motion is called a projectile. The path that the object moved is called the trajectory, okay? So this path, the path of the projectile is called a trajectory, okay? It's called a what? Trajectory. We always write our trajectory in terms of y, like y, because we're going to see how the equations work here and how y is going to appear here now, okay? Now, I want to introduce you a little bit to the, the, the equations, the equations of projector, okay? The equations of projector. I will start by teaching you what is wrong that people think is right, and then I'll teach you the right thing, and then you'll see the mistake of what was wrong, and then you fix it. So what is wrong is the equation, the assumptions in the equations. There are some wrong assumptions in the equations. We're going to see those assumptions. Those assumptions can give you the right answer, although, but they are not the, they are not the correct assumptions. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you the right equations to use. Normally, we have, I will start by case one, case number one. Let me start with an object falling freely from rest. This is the simplest projectile you can have. An object just falling freely from rest, okay? Okay, falling freely from rest. So it's a vertical downward motion, okay? Vertical downward motion, okay? So there's an object here in this plane and it starts falling down till it hits the ground here. Okay, it hits the ground here. Okay, so it falls through a height h. It falls through a height h. So I'm going to give an example here. But before I give that example, let me give you those assumptions I'm going to tell you. So those assumptions have to do with the equations that you use. The equations of linear motion. If you remember, I'm going to write them in a in a different way. Okay. We usually say v equals u plus a t. We call u your v naught. Is that okay? Okay, and then we say um, v squared equals u squared plus 2as, okay? And then we say s equals ut v naught t plus half a t squared, okay? Okay, we'll just stick to these three for now, okay? There is a fourth one we introduced, which was u plus v over 2 bracket t, it's like average velocity times time, okay? Uh, we won't be using this much, okay? We'll be using these three. Most, mostly, okay? I'll come back to the notation, you know. I just want to use this simple notation to express what I want to say here. These equations of motion that we did for linear motion in one dimension, we are going to use these same equations for projectile motion, okay? But we know in projectile, you are moving in a plane in the y-axis most of the time, okay? So these equations are going to have 
like some <coughs> y-axis stuff and some x-axis stuff. So we are going to flip some stuff. For now, I will do a just slight change. I will change this to, this will remain the same, v equals u plus a t. This will be v squared equals u squared plus 2ah, where h is my height. So now I'm talking about height, not linear distance now. Okay, but it is still the same as distance. So it's a vertical distance, so I label it as h. Is that okay? And then I say h equals ut plus half a t squared. So this, these are basically the equations I'm going to be using. Now I'm going to tell you the wrong assumption I want to do, okay? What is the wrong assumption I want to do? The wrong assumption is, I want to tell you that when an object is going up, when an object is moving up, I will take the equations to be positive. Sorry, negative. And when an object is falling down, I will take the equations to be positive. What do I mean by negative positive? Where we have the sign. So this is V equals U minus A T for an object going up against gravity. So I say, just because it's going against gravity, I will use the negative sign of gravity. Okay? Okay? This A, I forgot. Sorry about that. This A is going to change to G because G is the only acceleration in this case. Okay? This is another important thing you should know. Okay. okay, so the acceleration, all the accelerations we change to G, and all the distances we change to vertical distances, which I call H. Is that okay? So the acceleration is fixed. That is what it says there. So whether you throw, whatever speed you throw that object does not affect the acceleration. The acceleration remains the same as G, so long as you are moving as a projectile under the influence of gravity. Is that okay? So, so now this is V minus U minus GT, okay? I just put a minus because I say I'm moving up. If I'm moving down, this will be V equals U plus GT. You see the difference? If I'm going up, I say V squared equals U squared minus 2GH. If I'm coming down, I say V squared equals U squared plus 2GH. If I'm going up, I say H equals UT minus half GT squared. If I'm going down, falling down, I say H equals UT plus half GT squared. Now, these equations work, okay? These equations, they work very fine, but the assumption in these equations is, is wrong, okay? Okay, it's wrong, okay? So you don't tell me that when you are going up, you are moving against gravity, you have a minus. When you are coming down, you are moving with gravity, then you have plus. Is that okay? I'm going to explain the, the misconception there as well. But I'm going to solve problems with this. We'll get the correct answers, and we'll solve the problem with the correct assumption, and you see we get the same answers. Okay, but with the correct assumption now. Is that okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is this. Very easy. Very easy. Example one. I'm just gonna take an example here. Example one. A coconut fruit. Is it a fruit? Is coconut a fruit or what do you call it? Yeah. It's a fruit? I think so. Oh, a coconut, whatever? I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Just a coconut. Drops down from the top of a tree 45 meters tall. From the top, 45 meters tall. Okay? That's all I give you. I say calculate. One. The time taking to reach the ground, and two, the speed with which it strikes the ground, okay? So this is our first case, an object falling free, okay? So how do you solve the problem of an object falling free? Is that okay? Now it's falling, so I'm, I'm going to use the positive equations, okay? How you saying I'm going to use the positive equations, not the negative equations. So it's falling. So this, say this, a tree, okay, it's like a coconut palm, a coconut tree has some crazy stuff. I have a coconut here, falling from a height of 45 meters to the ground, okay? Okay? So all we have is H. Can you tell me something else that we have that's given from the problem but it's not told directly? Gravity. We have G. Good. What else? There's something else. You. U. V naught. It's falling. So it starts from zero. So V naught equals zero. So what are we looking for? T. So since I'm looking for T, I can use a lot of equations, okay? I can use H equals UT 
plus half gt squared. And I'm using plus because I said it's falling down, right? Okay, plus half gt squared. So now u is 0, which is v0, okay? u is 0. So h is just half gt squared. So what is t? Is square root of 2h over g, okay? 2h over g square root. Is that okay? So that becomes square root of 2 times the height for the 5. Let's use g to be 10, okay? 2 times 45 is 90. 90 divided by 10 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3 seconds. So it takes 3 seconds to fall down from that height of the tree. Correct. So what is the speed which, which strikes the ground? Now I'm looking for v. So I find another equation that has v. So I can use this and I can use that. And you discover any one you use, you get the same answer. Okay? I'm going to use both. Okay? So I have h, I have g, I have g, I have t. And u is 0 in both cases. Because it's starting from rest. Is that okay? So when I do that, when I do that, I find that for the two solution, v equals u plus gt, 0 plus 10 times 3, we just got t to be 3 seconds, 30 meters per second, that's the speed which strikes the ground. Or I say v squared is u squared plus 2gh, so u goes to 0. 2 times 10 times 45. Is that not? So 2 times 45 is 90 times 10 is 900. So what is V? Square root of 900. You still get 30 meters. So anyone you use, you get the same. You have enough information to use any equation. Any equation you use, you give the same. So long as everything you need is there in that equation. Is that okay? So this is how we solve this problem. And I have solved it with the wrong uh, intuition, which I'm going to correct. Okay? We see the very beautiful sublime way to solve those problems. And we'll continue from there. Now, we all understand case one, right? A body falling freely from rest. We know how to calculate anything there, right? Now, let's go to case two. A body projected vertically upwards. So, case two has case one inside of it. It will go up and then start falling down like a freely falling body, okay? So, projected vertically upwards, you go up and you start falling down. Before I get there, there is something important you know of a particle falling down. It starts with V0 or U equals zero. And then the U starts increasing 1, 2, 3, 4 until it gets to a maximum speed to hit the ground. Is that okay? So it starts from 0. Once you are dropping, you always start from 0 and your speed increases till you hit the ground. Is that okay? That's very important. Now let's go to case number 2. A body projected vertically upwards. A body, be very careful. Make sure you hear that vertically upwards. Once you hear that vertically upwards, then these equations are going to work. Okay? So if you are dropping vertically downwards or you are projected vertically upwards, then these equations are going to work. Okay? Now, case number two. I'm, I'm going to leave this box here. Okay? I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave this space too because I'm already correct equations here so we can compare when we get the time. Okay? So let me wipe this side. Am I too fast? Mm -hmm. I'm going at a good pace, right? Good. Don't worry. We are coming to the interesting part, okay? We are coming to the interesting part. It's very, very interesting what you're going to see later. So case two, like I said, we only have four cases. We're already in two, but some cases are deeper than, than some, okay? Some cases are deeper than some. So case two, a body projected vertically upwards. So what happens? I'll give you the dynamics. You go up, you start coming down. Normally, you're supposed to fall down on the same line, but just split them into two so you see clearly, okay? You go up and you fall down back on the same line, okay? So you go up, you start falling down. When you go up, you go with some u or v0, which is not zero. You have to give you some speed. So now, your initial speed is not zero, unlike the one that was dropping. So you go with some speed, you get to some maximum height we call h. So your speed, maybe you start with 10 meters per second, because of the influence of gravity on you, you, your speed will start reducing, reducing, 10, 9, 8, until you get to 0. At 0, you are at the maximum height, okay? Okay? At the maximum height, your final velocity V is 0. Then you start with another V, not 0, and start falling down again. You start increasing in speed again, again, until you hit the ground. Is that okay? The good thing about projectile motion is, if you are at point B, and at this point, B prime on the other side, your speeds are the same. At every point on the other side of your motion, your speeds are the same. Only your velocity is different. 
And why is velocity different? Because your direction is different. Because velocity is direction dependent. So if here is 20 meters per second, here will also be 20 meters per second, but minus. Is that okay now? Is that okay now? That's just the difference. It just means you're coming down. You're not going up. So if you start the object here with 30 meters per second, what will be the velocity of hitting the ground here? The same! So there are some problems you don't even need to solve. When they say a body is projected vertically upward to 30 meters per second, calculate the speed with which it hits the same place it was coming from is that same 30 meters per second. Okay? Okay? And we are going to prove it. We are going to see it as we move along. So if you have A and A prime, here will also be 30 meters per second. That's another property you should know. Another property you should know is the time taking T1 to go from here to the maximum height is the same time taking T2 to go from the maximum height back down. So the time it takes you to reach up is the same time taking to reach from up down. Is that okay? That's another important property. So the speed at every point has a corresponding speed on the other point, just a direction difference, okay? And the time taking to reach maximum height is the same time taking to fall back down. Is that okay? Now, note you are falling back to the same level. If I project something very vertically upwards and it falls back like this, <laughs> it only works here. Anything beyond here, that is when you will see the shortcomings of those, those equations can't solve this kind of problem. You have to solve, like for example, I'll give an example in this problem. You see how those equations are difficult to use, okay? Apart from the fact that they have a wrong assumption in them, okay? Okay? Now, let's take an example. I've just explained the phenomenon of what happens when you project an object vertically upwards. Three things. Number one, the, the speed at every point is the same speed at the corresponding point on its way back, but the velocity is what? Different. And number two, the time taken to reach maximum height is the same time taken to fall, to fall back down. And the speed you project at the bottom is the same speed to strike the, the same position. So let's take an example to see this. Yes. Okay, example. So this is example two. A ball is thrown vertically upwards with an initial velocity of 20 meters per second, okay? One, calculate the maximum height. Calculate the maximum height. Two, calculate the time taken to reach maximum height. The time taken to reach this height, okay? Three, calculate the total time of flight. So you know this is just twice of that, okay? Okay, the total time, total time of flight means from the beginning to the end, okay? Total time of flight. Four, calculate the speed with which it strikes the ground, okay? It strikes the ground. So we want to solve this problem with those equations, okay? Now, you start from here, you come back, you start with V0 or U, 20 meters per second, okay? The first question is for us to calculate where it will reach before it gets to zero velocity. So we know that V will be 0, u is 20. So at maximum height that we are looking for, at maximum height, that's the question number 1, what is the final velocity? 0, because it reduces to 0 there, is that right? So that's the trick here. You have to know at maximum height, v is 0, so you, you are indirectly giving v, u, and g always, okay? And now you are looking for h. So we say v squared equals u squared minus 2gh. We are using minus now because it's going up. We are considering the up part. <laughs> are you seeing now? Okay. We are using minus because we are considering the up part. Final velocity is 0 at h. So 0 equals 20 squared minus 2 times 10 times h. So what is h? 20h is 400. h is just 20 meters. 400 divided by 20. So it will get to 20 meters before it stops. Do we all get that? Do we all get that? Okay, good. Now the next question is, calculate the time talking to reach this height. So we're looking for T1. T1 
T1, okay, I will clean here again, don't worry. So T1 and T2, okay? So we're looking for T1 to get here, T2 to come back down, okay? So we use V equals U minus GT. At the maximum height, V is 0. 0 equals 20 minus 10T. So what is T? 20 over 10. When this 10T comes this side, is that okay? So T is just what? 2 seconds. Okay? So what is the total time of flight? 2 times 2. 4 seconds. Okay? 4 seconds. Are we there? Now, what is the speed with which it strikes the ground? Then we assume from here. It is falling from here now. And do falling motion. Okay? To see the speed with which it strikes the ground. Okay? So we assume it is falling from here. So we say V0 is 0. So we have H already. Okay? If I don't even need H, you know we have two equations we can use. We don't need H. We can just use V equals V0 plus GT to get the V of hitting. So V0 is 0 when it's falling back. It's just 10 times 2 seconds. The time taking to fall back, okay? Which is 20 meters per second, which is the same speed with which it was projected. That was what I'm trying to prove for you guys. Is that okay now? Now, all this is so much, so much trouble for nothing. So much trouble for nothing. So when you express these equations, these equations you see here, when you express them in their real form of change in position, like displacement, instead of just S and, and uh, H, the beauty is going to come out. Okay? Now let me explain this for you. Let me explain the inconsistency of those, of those equations. Are we okay? Now I come here. Gravity is always going down. So in physics, we define our axis. Going to the right is positive. You can choose here to be negative. It's your choice. But define it. But this is what we know. Going upward is positive. Going downward is negative. Going to the left is negative. Is that not? Gravity is always pointing down. So gravity is always negative. So whether you are going up or you are coming down, you don't change gravity. This is the first thing you should understand. So the correct equation there is the one that has minus. Irrespective of whether you are going up or you are coming down. Is that clear? The one that has plus is not correct. But when you are falling down, things are going to change in a way it looks like there is a plus there. <laughs> is that okay now? Is that, and that's the details I want to explain to you. So the right equations we're going to use, okay, are equations that look like that. Let me write them here, okay? Let me write the right equations here. Just so you can see. First of all, the right equations are going to have minus. So this is V. Let me say V equals V naught minus GT. This is correct, okay? The next one is V square equals U, uh, V naught square. Let me use this. Minus 2G, I will say Y minus Y naught. This is the second thing you need to know. It's a change of position. So Y naught is zero where you started from, for instance. And Y is wherever you are. I'm going to tell you why this is important. I'll give two examples why this is important. To use these equations rather than these ones. Okay? Then the last equation, y minus y naught equals v naught t minus half g t squared. This is all the equations you need to solve projectile motion. This is all you need. You don't need any of this. I'm going to now use this equation to solve the two examples we just did. Is that okay? The freely falling coconut. And the body, you will see the beauty in this equation. It's so beautiful. You will forget this immediately and throw it away. Okay? Now, let's see. Let's solve the coconut problem. Let's solve the coconut problem. Every other thing is true. The time taken to reach up is the time taken to come down. The speed here and the speed there. Every other thing is true. But that assumption that coming down is positive G and going up is negative G, no. G is always negative, whether you are going up or down. It's the position that changes. So, let's solve the coconut problem. Okay? Coconut problem, you fall from a height of 45 meters, right? Remember, the coconut fell from height of 45 meters. Okay? So what is Y not? Why not you say 45 meters? What is Y? Where you stop? Zero. Is that okay? Where you stop? Zero. So I want to get, the first question was for us to get a time of four, right? And what did we use to get that one? We said V equals V naught minus what? No, for the time. Sorry. For the time, we use H. Remember, we use H for the time. 
because that doesn't have, we don't know V yet. So we can't use that equation. So we use, so now we're going to use y minus y naught. We use h equals ut plus half gt squared. Now we're going to use y minus y naught equals v naught t minus half gt squared. Okay? We said this is the correct one, not this one. Okay? Whether you are falling or going up, this is the correct one. Now let's use this to solve the problem and get the same answer for t. So how do we get t? v naught is zero, right? But this is y minus y naught. What is y minus y naught? Zero minus 45. Zero, your final position, minus 45. Equals minus half g times t squared. So you see, this minus and this minus will now cancel. <laughs> then we come back to where we were before. So it just becomes 45 times 2 divided by 10 equals t squared. Okay? And we get the same 3 seconds. But we have used the correct assumption. We have used the correct assumption. So the secret is in this position changing once you are using the right equation. Is that okay? Now let's do the second problem. You will see the second problem that we assume time to go up, time to come down. You don't need those when you are using the right equation. What was the total time of flight for the second problem? Four seconds, right? We, how did we get the four seconds? We only calculated time taking to go up and multiplied it by two. We did calculate time taking to come down. If you are using the right equation, you can calculate the four seconds at one equation. You don't need to multiply it in by two. Let me show you that, okay? Now, let's use the right equation to solve example two. A ball thrown vertically upwards, okay? So the ball is thrown vertically upwards. What is the first question? Calculate the maximum height. So we say maximum height. So what do we say now? Y minus, um, we use the um, V squared. Is that not? Equals v naught squared minus 2g y minus y naught. Okay? Okay? So we say at maximum height, your final velocity is what? It's zero. So zero equals 20 squared minus 2 times 10 times y minus y naught. So you start from zero and you get to h. So what is your y naught? Zero. What is your y? H, the height you get. Is that okay? Is that okay? So this becomes H minus zero. So you get exactly the same thing. 20 H equals 400. From here we get H to be what? 20 meters as we got before. Using the correct equation. But this is also correct because in that assumption we already assumed going up is positive. I mean it's negative. Okay, so it tallies with our correct equation in that case. Is that okay? But now, that was by accident. Okay, <laughs> by accident. The assumption is zero. Okay? The second problem, the time taken to reach this height. The same thing, we said V equals V naught minus, sorry, GT. Is that okay? Minus GT. So we said final velocity at the maximum height is zero because we are looking for the time to reach there, okay? Initial velocity is 20 minus 10 times T. So we said 10T is 20. So we said T is 20 over 10. The same thing, two seconds to reach maximum height. Now let me show you where the miracle is. The time taking, the total time of flight. What we did, we multiply this by 2, is that not? No, you don't need to. This equation will give you that. Just one single equation will pop out the 4 seconds. You don't need to multiply it in by 2. That is another beauty of this following the right thing. So we say, y minus y naught is v naught t minus half g t squared. Is that not? You remember this equation? Now I want to see the total time of flight. What is total time of flight? I start from zero, I come back to zero. That's my total flight, right? So my y naught is zero, my y is zero. So what is the time taking to go from zero minus zero? <laughs> Do you see now? You see when we calculate that time, it will just come out four. <laughs> Do you understand? So you don't need to start saying, oh, let's calculate to reach maximum height first, multiply by two, or no. So I say zero minus zero, y minus y naught, is 20 times t minus half times 10 times t squared because I know my v naught is 20. So I'm looking for t. Is that not? So I said 0 equals 20t minus half of 10, 5t squared. So 5t squared is 20t. T cancels 1t here. 5t is 20. Take both sides by 5. Slight cancellation balance. 1 plus n over 2. To remember, you get your full seconds. 4 seconds. So, four seconds is the time taken to start from zero, go up, and come back to zero. No! 
Now, I'll give another example. I throw a ball up. At five meters on its way down, somebody caught it. How long did it take to read that? These equations are going to cry. <laughs> but that equation will work. Will prosper. Because it can tell you, you are starting from y not equals zero, you want to get to y equals five. And it's going to give you two answers for the velocity. One positive, one negative. One going up and one coming down. <laughs> are you getting it now? Are you getting it now? So let me give that example, okay? Let me give that example and we'll see how that works. So it, it, it brings out the beauty of using the correct, the correct equations. Is that okay? The correct equations. Okay. So the question says, example three, a stone is thrown vertically upwards with an initial velocity Twenty meters per second. Okay. It is caught on its way back down at a height of five meters from from the we call it the datum level. Okay, from the point of projection. Let me say that. Okay, five meters from the point of projection. So I say calculate one the time of flight. So the time of flight means the time taken to reach where it was caught. Okay, and two the velocity at the point it was caught. Okay. So simple. You start an object here with V naught equals 20 meters per second. On its way back, 5 meters from where it was projected, somebody caught it. So we're looking for T to travel here, there, and we're looking for V at that point. Okay? Simple. Just put your equation. Now, we need T and we have V naught. Okay? Okay? We need T and we have what? V naught. Is that okay? Now, we are looking for the time taking to reach here. So what is your y not? Zero. What is your y? Five. It's just a position. Five. Okay? Five. Now, why is five? Why not is zero? I'm looking for t. Okay? So I say y minus y not equals v not t. Are you seeing that now? Minus half g t squared. So what is y minus y not? 5 minus 0. V not t. 20 t minus half times 10 times t squared. So 5 equals 20 t minus 5 t squared. So divide through by 5. 1 equals 4 t minus t squared. So I have t squared minus 4 t plus 1 equals 0. I just need to solve this quadratic equation for t. Okay. If I solve this quadratic equation for t, I will get the time taken to reach there. Okay? And this t is going to give me two answers again. <laughs> okay? Because to reach 5 meters, don't forget there is another 5 meters on your way up. <laughs> so the one of the t's, the smallest one, is giving you the time on your way up to reach 5 meters. And the other one is giving you the time on your way down to reach 5 meters. <laughs> That's why it's a quadratic equation. You have two answers. Do you understand? Now, the next question said the velocity at the time it was caught. The same thing. The same thing. The velocity at the time it was caught. Now we know these equations. We can play with them around as we want. The velocity at the time it was caught. V equals V naught square minus 2G Y minus Y naught, right? We are looking for the velocity this V squared. V naught is 20 squared minus 2 times 10. Y minus Y naught is 5 minus 0. 20 squared is 400, minus 2 times 5 is 10 times 10 minus 100. So this is 300. 
So what is V is square root of 300? Is that okay? You are going to get a plus and a minus. So the plus tells you that it was on its way up because anything going up is what is positive. Anything coming down is what is negative. So the minus tell you the same value but on its way down. But the value for V is the same. But the value for T here cannot be the same. Because you can't have the same time to reach 5 meters up and the same time to reach 5 meters down. Do you see the difference there? You see the difference there? So when you use the correct equations, the beauty of these things become. Is that okay? Look at that equation. Say the velocity with which it strikes the ground when when the when the object was falling down. Remember, one of the questions was the velocity with which it strikes the ground. Let's use the right equation. V equals V naught minus G T, right? When you are falling, zero. Okay? And we knew the time to be 3 seconds for the coconut fruit. So put 3 here. 0 minus 10 times 3 minus 30 meters per second. You see, you will get a minus with it. So the minus tells you it's falling down. <laughs> you see now? But when you use those equations, they just give you 30. It has no sense of direction. It has nothing to tell you about the reality of the motion. Is that clear? So velocities going up are positive, velocities going down are negative, okay? And also acceler uh, acceleration is always negative because it's going down. Is that okay? Very important. Very, very important. Okay, let us see the next thing we are supposed to do here, okay? Now let's go to case number three, okay? Case number three. So we've seen case number one and two. We just use the normal equation. Even case number three, it is still the same normal equation. But case number three is what will lead us to the normal projectile. Case number four that you know, this one has a lot of information, okay? But case number three is when the object is projected horizontally. So when they say an object is projected, once you get that word horizontally, the whole math will change. So we're going to explain the math of horizontal projection, give examples, okay? Tell you how it works. Then we'll go to the last case and then we are closed for the day. Is that okay? So let's go to case number, case number three, okay? Case number three. Case three, don't forget, an important point is, all the cases, they follow the same equations, but slice changes depending on the, what, is the, what is going on, okay? The same equations, but you see how they change depending on the kind of motion, okay? So the equations we are using are the three equations with the minus sign. Only. Nothing else. And don't forget to put your y minus y naught. Okay? That's all you need to remember. Okay? Where you have uh, uh, the, the height, put y minus y naught. Case 3. A body projected horizontally. Now, horizontal projection means like this. From here, you project something with some velocity v naught. And it comes and falls like that. Okay? This is only where a body projected horizontally. Okay? So you can see it has a, a parabolic trajectory. Kind of. What is the trajectory of vertical? It's just the equation of y. Okay? So what is the trajectory of your vertical motion? Remember the vertically projected upwards? I will come back to that. I will discuss the trajectory of everything from the beginning. Okay? Just only trajectory. So you see what I mean. Okay? Let's finish this first. I will start with the trajectory of this. This is where you need to understand something very important. When we explain vectors, I told you if I have a force in the horizontal, say 10 Newton, this force has no vertical component because it's a horizontal force. If I have a force, 10 Newton, going upwards, this force has no horizontal component because it's a vertical force. The only force that can have a vertical and horizontal component is a force in between the vertical and horizontal at some angle. Now, you need to understand that from like this, you have horizontal motion separate from vertical motion. Even if both are combined. You see, he's falling down a vertical height, H. At the same time, he's covering some horizontal distance, X. But, if I want to compute H, everything I will use in computing H must be vertical or something. If I want to compute X, Everything I use to compute X must be horizontal things. Because vertical motion and horizontal motion are totally independent of each other. 
Point number one. Point number two. Where does gravity act? Down. So gravity only affects vertical things. <laughs> because it's straight down. It has no horizontal curve. So gravity cannot affect anything going there. So if I'm solving for H, gravity will appear in my equations. But if I'm solving for X, anyway I have G, I put zero. <laughs> Do you understand what is going on here? Do you understand what it is? Once you understand it from here, when we go to the last stage, it's as easy as taking a fatta. Very straightforward. Very, very straightforward. Now let's see. Let's, let's solve this case now, okay? So in every case like this, you see I'll say, considering vertical motion, then I start solving. So you know I'm discussing vertical. So considering horizontal motion, I start solving. You see I'm solving horizontal. Is that okay now? So, so let's start. Let's, let's do the general case of this. We'll get some equations. I will now tell you, give an example, and give you some secrets about this motion, okay? Some secrets that I might use to try you the exam, okay? All right. All right, all right. <laughs> Area. Yes, welcome to area. <laughs> now, let's see now. Let's look at this. See, get a, here's a new marker. Yes. Now, considering, let me start with the one you, considering horizontal motion, okay? Considering horizontal motion, I want to get, say, x. So remember we have y minus y naught equals v naught t, okay? Minus half gt squared. Remember this equation? I will now write it as x minus x naught because I'm considering horizontal motion equals v naught t minus zero because g is zero for horizontal motion. So for horizontal motion, this is all I need. So x minus x, if I just call it s, is just v naught times t. And V0 is surviving here because I projected horizontally. So we have a horizontal velocity. Do we have a vertical initial velocity? The body was projected horizontally. So the velocity is horizontal. So what is the vertical component of the velocity? Zero. So if I'm considering vertical motion, V0 will not appear. But G will now appear. <laughs> so this is something peculiar to horizontal motion. So be careful. When you say something is projected horizontally, you have a horizontal velocity, you have no vertical velocity. So your v naught x is your v naught, your v naught y is zero because there's no vertical component. Now, considering vertical motion, considering vertical motion, yes, sir. so I'll say y minus y naught equals v naught t, so this v naught y here was v naught x. But fortunately for us, v not x was the same as v not because it was a horizontal projection. Okay? But if I'm discussing vertical motion, it's now v not y times t minus half g t squared. So can I, can I throw away g now? No! Because I'm discussing vertical motion, I cannot throw away g. Here I threw away g because I was discussing horizontal motion and g does not affect horizontal motion. Are you getting that? Now, but here I will throw away v not y because v not y is zero. Are you seeing it now? So y minus y not. Listen, what is y? Your y is, let's say h, where you started from. What is your y? Um, your y not is h. So what is your y? Zero when you stop. So this becomes zero minus h equals half g t squared. So the minus. So you see how the minus cancels out now? So I have h equals half g t squared. So t is square root of 2h over g. This is the time it takes a particle to fall from rest from here down. It is the same time it takes this particle to go there. There is a problem like that. A particle is dropped straight down. At the same time, a particle is projected horizontally at some speed. Which particle will get down first? They will get down at the same time. Do you know why? Because that particle that was projected horizontally, the vertical part of that particle is exactly like that falling from zero. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> Do you understand? So, forget that it's going like this. The, the motion like this has no connection with the motion like that. 
So when you fall, when a particle falls freely, we know how it works. When a particle goes like this, if we want to compare the motion of this particle with a particle falling freely, we compare the part of the motion in the y-axis. And the part of this motion in the y-axis behaves exactly like that particle falling freely. So, they will fall at the same time. <laughs> that is one of the secrets of this motion. Okay? Now, I'll give an example. You see how this works, okay? Okay, I'll give an example. You see how this works. So, example, I will just say it in words and draw it. So, from the height of, say, 90 meters, okay? Well, let me use 45 meters again because it's easy for us to, to use. Okay, a, a, a bullet is shot horizontally with a muzzle velocity of 100 meters per second, okay? So, once you see horizontally, this is how you draw the diagram. So, I ask you, calculate the time of flight, T, and also calculate how far from the base of maybe a cliff where it was shot will it hit the target, okay? Okay, how far will it hit the target? So, X, we're looking for T and X. But I already know that T is square root of 2H over G from the vertical motion consideration. So, the thing is, once you've solved all this, you've proved all this before, you don't need to prove them again. So if I'm in the exam now, and this is strange to me, I'll start thinking of vertical motion and horizontal. the time is going. But because I've solved the proof before, I know for horizontal projection, the time of flight is square root of 2h over g. But your professor will not give you that. Your professor will give you all the crazy equations, these ones. <laughs> he will give you these ones in your book, and he expects you to be able to derive these ones from there. But that derivation in the examination hall is a bad idea. So the, the derivation is outside. So you're supposed to have done it outside before. Okay? So I have done the derivation from here, and I got my time of flight for horizontal projection to be this. So I just use it. Square root of 2 times 45 over 10. 90 over 10. Square root of 3. The square root of 9. 3 seconds. Simple. Now, what is x? x is just v not t. Remember? It's just the horizontal velocity times the same time you just got. 100 times 3. 300 meters. So they will tell you, if an object, you are trying to shoot this bullet to hit a target that was 350 meters away, will it hit that target? No, because it will stop at 300 meters. So this is how they can manipulate the question for you. Or they will give you the 300 meters, and say, what is the horizontal speed that it should get to hit that target? You are walking backwards. Now you have, you have x, you are looking for v0. So calculate t again from here, put it here, put your x there, then you get the v0 that corresponds to that x. Two important equations. When an object is projected horizontally. Two important equations. Number one, the time of flight is just square root of 2h over g, or square root of 2y minus y0 over g. And your x distance, say x minus x0, is just v0, the horizontal velocity times time. These are the two equations you need to solve any problem when it's horizontally projected. Is that okay? Now, I'm introducing you to some weird to some weird stops or stuff, okay? I'm traveling in a car. This is very important, okay? So that we have thing. The car is moving at say 60 miles per hour. And then I drop the marker outside from my car, I, from the window I drop this marker. What will happen to the marker? What is the path the marker is gonna take? What's the trajectory of the marker? Will it go straight down? It's going to go like that, right? That marker I'm dropping will have the same speed as the car that was moving. So it's going to be a horizontal speed. So it's going to follow the trajectory. Is that okay? If I'm moving in a car at 60 miles per hour and I throw something from my car forward at 3 miles per hour, the speed of that thing is 63. Is the speed I was moving plus the speed I put inside? Is that okay? Okay. Why am I saying that? 
let's assume there is somebody in a plane, like a service plane, okay? And this person in this service plane dropped, was moving at, say, 20 miles or 2,000 miles per hour, okay? Well, let me say meters per second. I'm not used to you guys, man. It's so fine. Okay. Now he drops something. So I know that thing is going to go like this, right? Is that not? It's going to go like that. that, that. But the person in the plane is not going to see that. What the person in the plane is going to see is the body going straight down. Because he himself is moving with the same horizontal velocity. <laughs> Do you understand? So the person in the plane, according to the person in the plane, looking down at what he threw, you down is going to see that path, but the person in the plane is just going to see, you keep seeing the particle going down, going down here. That's another important secret you need to understand. Is that okay? Now! Something very important here. Remember when we did the vertical case, we asked you about the speed with which it strikes the ground, right? If they ask you here the speed with which this particle projected horizontally strikes the ground, please be careful. It strikes the ground like that. So it strikes the ground with what speed? Don't forget, we only have a V not X that does not change because gravity doesn't affect it. So the V not X at the point of striking the ground is still there at, as the X component. So we need to find V Y. So your V X, your final velocity of X is the same as the initial velocity of X because the velocity is constant. Gravity does not affect it, the horizontal part. But what about the vertical part? You start from zero, V not Y was zero, okay? But there is a V Y that is not zero. What is that V Y? Is V not Y minus what? GT. You see that now? But V not Y is what? Zero. So it's just what? Minus GT. That is why it's coming here. So just put GT. The minus sign means it's going down. So you have two velocities. So this is V Y now, your V final Y. And this is your V final X is the same as your V initial X because the X velocity does not change. So what is the velocity with which it strikes the ground? It is the net velocity. You have to use your Pythagoras as if you are finding two forces resultant, net force. Be careful about that. So it's going to be d squared plus d squared square root. Square root of vfy squared plus vfx squared. So it doesn't strike the ground straight like the vertical. It strikes the ground at some angle. So to get the velocity of striking, you need to get the x component and the y component of the velocities and get a net velocity. Is that clear? Is that clear? Now, if somebody asks you to find the trajectory of this path, like I said, to find the trajectory, you just solve y. So we have that x. Let me just minus. Let's say x naught is 0. y naught is... Uh, uh, okay, we have some y naught. Okay, let me put them there. Okay, let me just say uh, x minus x naught is v naught t. Remember, for horizontal motion, y minus y naught is v is v naught for y is zero so it's just y minus y naught was what minus half g t squared right remember when i put v naught y to be zero okay for the horizontal i'm still discussing horizontal motion i saw for t here t is x minus x naught over v naught and then i put it in the equation of y this is how you get a trajectory all the time so for time in the x component Put your value of time in terms of x inside the y equation. Anything you get for the y in terms of t, in terms of x now, is your trajectory. Okay? So I solve for t from the x equation. This is the two equations. Okay? From here, I got the square root of 2h over g. Okay? This equation, t is this. I put it here. So it becomes y minus y naught equals minus half g x minus x naught over v naught squared. This is the trajectory. So you see that the trajectory is quadratic in x, x squared. Once you have a quadratic in x, it's a parabola. That's what it tells you. It's a parabolic function. So when I go to the last case, which I'm going to go to now, so we conclude, okay? I know time is going and we are getting tired. Me too, I'm getting hungry, okay? So I'm going to, I'm going to do the last case, which is the very important case, okay, that most people talk about in most texts, and we'll see how that works. Okay. 
All right. So the last case for projectile motion, case number four, is a body projected at some angle, okay? Like this. I'm going to wipe out the whole board for you to understand this, okay? We define a maximum height h, the horizontal range I will call r, which is like your x minus x naught, okay? This is like your y minus y naught, okay? This is like your x minus x naught, okay? Okay? And then some initial velocity v naught. So now in this case, this v naught at some angle theta will have two components now. v naught x and v naught y. Because it's in between. And what I taught you in vectors, in the last vector class, I told you when you have a vector, like a force, in between some axis, say 30 degrees, the x component will always have the cosine of that angle, and the y component will have the sine of that angle. But if the angle was here, 30 degrees, the y component will have cosine of that angle, and the x component will have the sine. So note that x is always cosine and y is always sine. It depends on which angle you are using. Is that okay? So in this case, we have a v not x and a v not y. Okay? So our v not x is just v not cosine theta, and our v not y is just v not sine theta. Do we all agree on this? v not cosine theta is the x component of this v not. V naught sine theta is the y component of this unit. Then we now discuss vertical motion separate where we have G. Then we discuss horizontal motion separate where we don't have G. So the difference between this and the horizontal one is here we don't have V naught Y. We only have V naught X. But here we have both. That is the simple difference. I will just solve the equations and get different things. That's just the simple difference. Is that okay? <coughs> now let me solve the equations for you. So let's consider vertical motion. So let's say considering vertical motion. So let's start with vertical motion. So let's consider vertical motion. As first, so let's use this equation. V squared is V not squared, V not Y squared minus 2G Y minus Y naught. Okay? You know this equation, right? You know this equation, right? So this is V not Y is V not sine theta squared. That's my V not Y squared. Minus 2GH, where H is my maximum height. At maximum height, what is my final velocity? Zero, right? So the same thing happens here. The speed here and the speed here are the same. Just that the velocity is different. Here it's going like this, here it's coming like that. <laughs> so here it's positive, here it's negative. But the magnitude is the same. At the maximum height, the speed is zero. That's what we did here. So what do we have here? What is H? V not squared sine square theta, when I put the square in here, equals 2gh. So h is v not square sine square theta over 2g. So when you have this problem, I say, find the maximum height. This is the formula you use. How did they get it? From the same equation of motion using the conditions you have. Is that okay? That is the maximum height. Now, if I say, what is the time taken to reach maximum height? I go like this. Time taken to reach maximum height, I call it small t. So v equals v not y minus gt. You see that? Okay? So this is, at maximum height, v is 0. v not y is just v not sine theta minus gt. So gt is v not sine theta. So what is the time taken to reach maximum height? V not sine theta over G. And we just got the maximum height itself to be V not squared sine squared theta over 2G. You see all the equations coming up? If the time taken to reach maximum height is this, what is the total time of flight? Time Simple! But I'm still going to prove it. Let's leave it for now, okay? I'm still going to prove it, okay? That is going to be this equation. Y minus Y naught equals V naught Y T minus half G T square. Are you okay now? But we want to go from zero to zero. Remember, that's what we're doing. The total time of flight. We start from zero, end at zero. And see the time it will give us. We discover it will give us twice this. So let me use capital T here to separate it from the small t to reach maximum, uh, maximum height, okay? So this is V naught Y, V naught sine theta times capital T minus half G capital T square. Are you getting it now? 
So what is the time it will take you to start from zero and end at zero? We're going to get twice of this. So we see this is zero equals v naught t sine theta minus half g t squared. So I bring this here, okay? Half g t squared equals v naught t sine theta. So t cancels one t here. Two goes in there. g t is two v naught sine theta, and divide by g. So what is the total time of flight? Two times what we got before, v naught sine theta over g. So if you understand what we did from vertical project, it is just the same thing, but a different scenario every time. A different scenario every time. So that's my total time of flight. Now let's get the horizontal range I call R, your x minus x naught. That is a horizontal thing. Now I have to consider horizontal motion to solve that. Is that okay now? I have to consider horizontal motion to solve that. So to get the horizontal range, so I will say considering horizontal motion, Yeah, we've barely spent about an hour, not not so much. So it's, a, it's an hour and a few minutes, right? But that, that, that's, that's okay now. We'll soon be done, okay? Yes. So, considering horizontal motion, so we want to get x minus x naught now. Is that right? x minus x naught equals v naught xt minus half gt squared. But we know g does not affect horizontal motion. So our equation just becomes x minus x naught, which I call my r, is v naught xt. And this t is the capital T because it's the time from here to there. Is that okay now? So r, the horizontal range, because v naught x is v naught cos theta, because that's the horizontal component of the v naught, times the t, which we got to be 2v0 sine theta over g. Then I multiply this out. So it becomes v0 square over g times 2 sine theta cos theta. I just brought 2 sine theta cos theta 1, then v0 times v0 separated. Okay? It's the same thing. Is that okay? Are we getting that? Did you get this part? This simplification? 2 sine theta cos theta in trigonometry, 2 sine a cos b is sine 2a. Uh, 2 sine a cos a, sorry, is sine 2a. So 2 sine theta cos theta is sine 2 theta. So it becomes v naught squared sine 2 theta over g. The horizontal range. Okay? So I'm going to give a simple example and then I'll tell you special cases like I did for the horizontal projection. And then we are done with the fourth case. Okay? Another thing I'm supposed to talk about is relative velocity. I'll just solve two examples on that to explain it, and then we are done, okay? Now, let's take an example now. So all we need, I just proved all this formula. This is the formula you need. Time to reach maximum height, no time of flight. Once you memorize this, you're done. But at least you know how they were derived. Is that okay? You know how they were derived, okay? Example. A body is projected with a horizontal velocity of 100 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees. Okay? That's all I give you. Calculate the maximum height. I did an exam one day on projector and I read through the question really fast and I failed. You know why? Because the angle he gave, he said at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical. I wasn't paying attention. So what the angle he gave was this angle. So I was supposed to get 90 minus that to get the projectile angle to use. <laughs> so we are in a hurry. Sometimes you miss some information. So pay attention, okay? Pay attention, okay? Not just the angle you use. Is it to the vertical or to the horizontal? We work with the angle to the horizontal. So if you are given the angle to the vertical, subtract it from 90, the answer you get is the angle you should use. Is that okay? Pay attention to that. That happened to me a long time ago in high school. <laughs> I learned the lesson really early. <laughs> okay, now, let's say 60 degrees to the horizontal, so we don't have to minus anything. So that's the correct angle, okay? So it's like this. It's 100 meters per second like that. 100 meters per second, that's our V naught. Okay? And at an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal. Okay? So we are looking for maximum height H and range R and total time of flight T. 
So simple. Maximum height h is v naught squared sine squared theta over 2g. We just proved it, okay? That's 100 squared times sine squared 60 degrees over 2 times 10. We just use g to be 10. So it's a 10,000 sine squared 60 means sine 60 squared. Total point 866 squared, okay? Divided by 2 times 10, 20, okay? Just do this. You get your answer. d square times 1,000 divided by 20, it just gives you your answer in meters. Is that okay? Now, what is your range? The same thing. Just chug and plug. Just, just plug and chug, you call it. Just plug and chug it. So you have your range R is V naught square sine 2 theta over G. So it's 100 square sine 2 times 60 over 10. So it's 10,000 times sine of 120 degrees. So you see, you times the angle before you take the sine. That's a sine 2 theta, okay? Sine of 120 degrees divided by 10. So it's 1,000 times sine 120, 0 0.866 again. So that will give you 866 meters. That's your range. So what's the time of flight? The same. Plug and chop. T is 2 V naught sine theta over G. You already know it. So it's just 2 times 100 sine 60 degrees over 10. Okay? So it's 2 times 100 sine 60 is 0 0.866 divided by 10. So it's 20 times 0 0.866. 17.32 seconds. Easy! Once you just know the formulas, you don't need to go back and derive. But like I said, your professor might not give you this formula straight ahead. He thinks you should be able to derive them from those basic formulas. And inside the exam, it's not a good place for derivation. The place for derivation is here, outside. Make sure you derive them, make sure you have them at the back of your mind. Either you write them at the space you give for extra formulas, or you memorize them and go in. It makes your calculation faster. Okay? And in case you forget, Try to practice the derivation on your own so you can easily derive them back. They are easy to derive once you know what you are working on. Okay? Now we have special cases about this. Special cases. I'm going to wipe off the whole board, talk about the special cases. Like I said, this video is going to be up for you guys to rewatch, okay? And review what we did. I think it's better when you are in the class and you watch it again. Like, it's like a review for you then. And some things that you didn't catch very fast, you can catch them slow, you can pause it. You know, right, try to derive them yourself and, you know. There is something we call maximum range. Maximum range means if I have one velocity, any velocity at all, okay, at what angle will I put that velocity that we go to the maximum x? 45 degrees. Good. How do we get that? I'll show you. Let's write our range formula. Our range formula is v naught square sine 2 theta over g, right? If we want a maximum range, you know the sines and cosines of angle, they go from minus 1 to 1. Maximum is 1, minimum is minus 1. You can't get any sine angle that's beyond 1 or lesser than minus 1. Is that okay? Okay? 0 point something, 1 is the highest, sine of 90 degrees, okay? So, for us to get maximum range, this sine 2 theta has to be 1. Because anything less than 1, we reduce it. 0 point something, we reduce it. 0 point something, but if it is 1, that's the maximum. And for you to have 1, 2 theta has to be 90 degrees. So, what is theta? So, your theta has to be 45 degrees for your range to be maximum. So, at maximum range, sine 2 theta is 1. So, your maximum range has V naught squared over G. Because the sine theta part has gone to 1. And the angle that can give you this is 45 degrees. 2 times 45, 90, sine of 91. And then you get that. Is that clear? That's one of the special cases we need to talk about. Another special case. I told you before that when a particle is going up, at the same position coming down, it has everything the same. Is that not? Apart from this direction that makes the velocity different. But the speed is the same, is that not? Good. I have an object from the top of a cliff. This is my horizontal. One of these objects I throw straight down with a velocity v naught at an angle theta. The other one I throw like this at the same angle theta to the horizontal with a velocity v naught. 
which one, this one follows a path like this, this one goes up and comes down like that. Which one of them hits the velocity? Which one will have the highest final velocity to hit the car? The one that shot up or the one that came straight down? Isn't it the same? Yes. But how is it the same? That's what I'm going to prove to you right now. This one is coming straight down here, right? This guy here is going up. Don't forget here is the same coming down. When you get to this position, the velocity you start here is the same going like this. But here the velocity becomes like that. You see, at exactly that same position, it has the same properties as this. Theta and beta. So when that particle goes up, once it comes back to that position, it just takes into, it just uh, embraces the same properties as this guy, the, the second guy. And then from there down, they will have the same final velocity. Do you understand? Do you understand that? That's another special case. And when they ask you to find the velocity of striking, don't forget, okay? Don't forget, okay? I told you the velocity with which you, you throw a body up, okay? The velocity with which you throw a body up is the same velocity with which it what? It strikes the ground. Is that not? The same velocity with which it what? Strikes the ground. Now I want to I want to ask, I want to give you an example. Let me see. There's a particular example I'm trying to see. Uh, okay. Okay. Let me, do we get this part? Correct. Another thing you need to know is for range, we have two possible angles also. Okay? <laughs> That's a very big secret, okay? <laughs> okay? It's not really a secret. It's in textbooks, but it's like something that sounds weird. If I have an antelope here, okay, uh, an animal or something I want to shoot at, like that. Sorry, I'm from Africa. We shoot at those. Yeah, I know you don't. But Africa will kill anything we can eat. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to shoot at this antelope. The range is R. It's fixed. I have one velocity. There are two different angles I can shoot at that antelope. It's weird, but it's true. There are two different angles. That same velocity, if I shoot at this angle, theta 1, I shoot at this angle, theta 2, it will still hit it. How do we get those two angles? Are I'll show you. Is yes. it the same distance from 45 degrees? Is that meaning, like, say one is, the one angle is 35 degrees, would the other angle be 55 degrees? The same distance from the maximum? Yes. That's one way to view it. Or just say 90 minus the first angle. Like you said, 35 and 55, that's still 90. You understand? I'm going to prove why it is like that. Okay? See the formula. See the formula. Let's say, let's say, okay, I want to shoot at this antelope. Okay? This antelope is, um, say, 200 meters away. And I shoot with a velocity of, say, 100 meters per second. And I say, what angle do I need? To hit that range, okay? So I say my range is V naught square sine 2 theta over G. Now I have the range 200 meters. My V naught is 100 square sine 2 theta over 10. I want to know what angle we give me. You see two angles we appear. You see how the two angles we appear, I'll show you, okay? Now, it's because of the sine property. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. So 200 times this is 2000 equals 10,000 sine 2 theta. So divide by 10,000. Divide by 10,000. So what is sine 2 theta? 2,000 over 10,000, 330.2. Now, what is 2 theta? It's the sine inverse of 0 0.2. Are you getting it? But sine inverse of 0 0.2 has two different values. There are two different angles that will give you 0 0.2 as their sine. Because when you look at the quadrants, here we say Ali stole Titinopoulos' cup. That's what we say. Or all students take coke. So what that means is, here all the trigonometric functions are positive. Sine, cosine, and tangent positive. Here only sine is positive, the rest will be negative. Here only tangent is positive, the rest will be negative. So if I take an angle here, say 240, find the sine, it will be negative. Find the cosine. Only the tangent will be positive. 
Okay? Here, any angle between 0 and 90, all will be positive. Here, only the sine will be positive. Now, do the sine inverse of 0 0.2. What will it give you? It will give you 11 point something. Subtract that 11 point something from 180 degrees. You get 160 something point something. Sine of 11 point something will give you 0 0.2. Sine of 160 something point something will give you 0 0.2 also. So there are two angles that can correspond to this sine inverse. Okay? There are two angles that correspond to this sine inverse. And, um, oh, I, I, I did it at home, but I didn't bring it. Okay, let me, I think I have my calculator. Yes, I have. So let's say sine inverse of function sine of 0 0.2. 11.53. Subtract that from 180 or 54. 168.46. So 11.5 and 158.5. So 11.5, sine of 11.5 will give us 0 0.2. Sine of 158.5 will also give us 0 0.2. So how many angles correspond to sine inverse of this? 11.5 degrees or once. 58.5 degrees, okay? 168.5, 168.5. Are we good now? Now, 2 theta is either 11.5 or 2 theta is 168.5. So when you divide by 2 to get theta, you get 2 angles at 4 for that range. Is that okay now? Do you see how the 2 angles come about? So it's from the sign, because sign is positive here and also positive here. So if you have a positive number for sine, there's an angle corresponding to it in this quadrant. There's another angle corresponding to it in that quadrant. The same for cosine. If you have a cosine positive thing, there is an angle in this quadrant that will have a positive cosine also. Tangent. If you have a tangent positive, an angle here and an angle here will give you that same angle. So we have two values for each of those. Cells. And it goes more. It's like going from 0 to 360. Cosine 0 is 1, cosine 360 is 1. Go around again from 360 times 2. 360 plus 360. That's going to give us what? 720, right? So cosine 720 will still give us 0. It's a periodic. So many angles will give you cosine of 1. <laughs> and you just keep going. So that's depending on whichever quadrant that you are. A ball is thrown from the top of a building with a velocity of, say, 20 meters per second at an angle 40 degrees. And there's another building here, okay? And this is separated 50 meters from there. So the question is, if this ball goes up, how far above or below this position will it strike this building? Looks complicated, but very simple. Very simple. So we are looking for either here, or maybe it's going to strike it there. We don't know. Some y. Okay? So we use our equations. Y minus Y not. Is that okay now? But what do we have? Look at what we have. We only have this distance. Okay? The, v, the, 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 the X distance. Okay? So here, I'm going to use V squared. Is V not Y squared minus 2G Y minus Y not. And for the X, I will use x minus x naught equals v naught xt because there is no g. I'm using a different equation, but there is no g. Are you okay? Now, x minus x naught is 50. v naught x is the x component of this. 20 cosine 40 degrees. 20 cosine 40 degrees times t. From here, I get my what? t. After getting t, this equation will give me the final velocity. I will just put v naught here, the final velocity at that point. But I don't need that velocity because I still need to get that y minus y naught first, okay? I will now use y minus y naught equals v naught y t minus half g t squared, okay? Now there is y is going to be affected by g. So y minus y naught, which is what I'm looking for, is v naught, let me just call it y, v naught y t is 20 sine 40 times, I just got my t here to be 50 divided by that. 
So let's just say the answer you're going to get is like, um, say, three seconds. Okay, that's my t, for instance. Okay, minus half times ten times three squared. When I solve this, I get my y. So when I solve this, I'm going to get a negative number, minus something. So when I get that minus something, okay, it tells me y is negative, it's this way. If I get a plus answer, it means it's this way. The same equations, no matter how complicated the problem is, just put the equations there. For x, no g doesn't appear. When you, have, when you, want, to, when you want to use 50, use equations that x, dg will not appear. But when you want to use, when you want to get your y's or anything, g will appear in your equations. That is the simple secret. Oh yes, before I forget, uh, I didn't prove the equation of the trajectory for the other projectile. The projectile that goes like this, the case number four, okay? So we know we go with V0. So we have V0 x to be V0 cosine theta. And we have V0 y to be V0 sine theta. So when we consider horizontal motion, we said x. So let's say y equals y not, uh, y not equals x not equals zero. So let's just put the not to be the origin. So they start from the origin, say, okay? So if we do that, I know y minus y not, which will just be y, is just v not y t minus half g t squared. So v not y is v not sine theta times t minus half g t squared, okay? I keep this equation, I call equation one. So this is from vertical motion. If I consider horizontal motion, I get the same thing but without a v, x minus x naught equals v naught x t, so minus half g t squared, we go to zero because g doesn't affect x motion. So it becomes x minus x naught, which I just call x because I put x naught to be zero. So x is just v naught x, which is v naught cosine theta times t. So from here, I find t. Remember the trick? You get t from the x, put it in the y. <laughs> That's all. So t becomes x over v naught cosine theta. So I call this equation 2. So if I put equation 2 in equation 1, so I have y equals v naught sine theta. So instead of t, I have x over v naught cos theta minus half g t squared x over v naught cos theta squared. Is that okay? So this is the equation. v naught cancels v naught sine theta x sine theta over cos theta minus half g x squared over v naught squared cosine squared theta. Sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. So x tan theta minus half g x squared or minus g x squared over 2 v naught squared cos squared theta. So this is the equation. It's also a parabola because it's a quadratic in x in terms of. That's just it. So this is the equation of trajectory for that. So the equation of trajectory for a body projected vertically upwards is just your y equation because there's no x equation. So it's just y minus y naught equals v naught t minus half g t squared. So it's just square in time because there's no x thing. So this is your trajectory for a body projected vertically upwards. So just so you don't miss that, trajectory for the case 4 and trajectory for the case 1. It's just the equation in terms of y. How does the y behave as time goes? along okay either with respect to x or with respect to with respect to time all right thank you